Hello, and welcome to the apiary. This is Jake B. Man with Golden Fox Farms. And today is a very special day on the beekeeping calendar. And that is the first day you see pollen coming in the door. Uh, in an average year, pollen flows will usually ballpark around first week of March for us. This is another El Nino year. As we're seeing the flooding in California again, like we had last time, we're probably going to have another early spring this year, and the trees already have pollen flowing a good month ahead of their normal schedule. And this opens us up for a great conversation on phenology. Phenology is the movement of the seasons and the reaction of plants and animals to those seasonal changes. And this marks a pretty big one. Uh, my bees are very conservative in stores, which means they really don't start brood rearing until we start to get food coming in the front door, in this case, pollen. And this really starts the clock on the brood rearing and the swarm cycles and everything else. Hence the reason to discuss phenology. Now, when it comes to phenology, some of us have written calendar guides that we can use as a basis, and I'm one of those beekeepers. This guide actually was put together by a guy named John Benham, who's a master beekeeper in my state, and I've taken it and used it for my own purposes. And it kind of gives me a gauge of when certain events will be happening in the hive. And I can use that to roughly frame up a calendar with what I expect to happen when. Now I'll try to get a copy of this put up on the, uh, at least a link for you all to find it on the website. Uh, and it has some good information in there, especially if you're a new beekeeper, uh, especially if you're an older beekeeper that just needs to remind yourself of the order of things. For me in the average year, Valentine's Day marks the beginning of the beekeeping season. Uh, and the reason why I say that, one, he's the patron saint of beekeepers, so that's always fun to know. Uh, that's also when I've got a pretty solid idea of which colonies are doing well and which ones are not. Both of these nukes have pretty good populations at the front door. There's a lot of forage going in. There's an increasingly large cloud of bees that I'm blocking the entrance for, uh, but they seem to be doing very well. Uh, and that's what I really look to figure out with my Valentine's Day time window is which colonies are still with us. I could check for feed if I was concerned about feed. Most of these colonies we're fed up to wait, so I really just am not that concerned about it just yet. Uh, but that's where we are right now. Uh, we also need to be really building up materials because these bees are already starting to grow their brood nest with that pollen going in. So swarm season ain't that far off. And a lot of times March and April are make or break months in terms of the weather. Uh, this year it'll be March, in normal years it'll be April. If the bees can fly and forage, we're going to have big old brood nests and a lot of bees in a busy swarm season. If they get locked in, uh, if the weather is poor, or if we have a late freeze, we could actually see them go backwards and start to cannibalize brood. i uh, give you all an idea. Last year, we had another El Nino year, and spring was a month early, and then we had a freeze on April 28th. Now, if you're a schedule, if you're a month ahead of schedule uh, in terms of blooms and weather, and you have a freeze, then uh, that's like having a freeze at the end of May, which is insane for us to have. But in terms of uh, flowers and effects on the colonies, that's exactly what it was. Uh, and this is one of the issues we run into with El Nino seasons and more variable weather is. It might get warm earlier, but we're still going to have those cold snaps come in on the backside and stall and mutilate these colonies. Now, since this seems to be an early running year, in some respects, we can treat February like we normally treat March. And that means this is where we're going to start to see our colony population really start to move. Because that pond's coming in, they're going to start brooding. That also means this is when they really start burning through their stores. And this is when you can have hives suddenly go into starvation if there's a stall in the food flows, which is a frequent problem when it's this early in the year. Uh, you can feed them. Some people feed a one-to-one. -one. Now keep in mind, if you're feeding a syrup product, you want to have the temperatures reliably above 55 degrees. Uh, we're 61 degrees today, but in another four or five days, the highs are going to be in the mid-40s, and those syrups are going to be hard for the bees to take down. Now, it's usually April when things start to get a bit overwhelming. Uh, and again, early year, might be March this year. 
this is where we have multiple food sources available. Drone population starting to peak. Uh, and the queens are laying at their max. And this is kind of the front edge of our swarm season. Uh, I've got a peer who reliably has her first swarm first week of April. Now, she does not practice swarm control. Uh, I do. I can usually hold my colonies in until May. But that's the usual, and that is labor-intensive. Uh, we do have a lot of wet weather in April, and that can lead to wet weather diseases like foul broods, European foul brood, sack broods, and, and chalk brood. Uh, chalk brood, in many respects, is a chilled brood disease, and that usually spikes around that time of year. What's kind of happening is the brood nests are growing at a rate faster than they're producing nurse bees, so to speak. And the nurse bees can somewhat get outclocked by the size of the brood nest, and they can't keep it warm when a chilling event happens. Another aspect of this is when do I super? Uh, I'll tell you right now, you can't super a hive too early, uh, at least not in my region. So you can super these hives as early as March or April if you wanted to. Now, odds are they won't use it, uh, but it's there for them to move up into when they need it. Now, we'll usually still see the colonies pretty booming and prone to swarming all through May. And that usually stalls out in June. June is usually what marks the end of our swarming season here. Uh, again, all things considered, you can have swarmier years than others. But with June, and really getting into July, we're actually already past our major flows. Our main flows here are really uh, locusts and tulip poplar. And once we get on the other side of that, things usually start to slow down. We're very tree flow specific. We will have clover, but clover here tends to not produce a huge surplus crop and usually stalls out towards the end of July, depending on weather. So that means a lot of our honey production is done by the end of July. And supers can come off hives and you can transition to setting up hives for fall preparations. Uh, now that said... We haven't talked about mite treating at all. Uh, with mites, often May is your first good window in our area to handle mites in terms of the earliest treatment you can do on the calendar. Uh, because usually it's the right temperature range for formic products. And there's a lot of brood in the hive, so that's also formic products. So if you have a high mite count early in the year, you can knock it down with formic during that time. Uh, once the supers come off, which, you know, they have no purpose being on the hives in August here, uh, you can use any of the other products that are not considered honey safe, uh, which would be your thymols, your amitrazes, and all that stuff. So we have a pretty healthy window to operate with that here. That leads to relatively rough management times of the year, August and September. Uh, this is where the new beekeepers find out the bees sometimes aren't quite so friendly when the flow is not on. Uh, it can be a challenge for a lot of them. Uh, August usually is a dearth here, a significant dearth. And attempts at feeding often end up in robbing situations. So in many cases, we would recommend against feeding here during August uh, and wait until getting into September. We have flow start up again after the August dearth. Uh, usually the wing stems are the first things that come in, um, followed by bone set and some other uh, late bloomers that fill out the fall until we get into goldenrod and aster that finish us. Um, so often the best thing to do is just leave enough feed on the hives with the harvest and just catch them on the back end afterwards and then get them back up to wait after you knock the mites off and get them prepared to enter winter with a good healthy population. Now, a recurring challenge we face is all of these recommendations are based on where I am in the world. I am in the Region 6 in the United States, roughly between Louisville and Cincinnati. Uh, and things like a Valentine's Day start of the season date for me makes sense, but might not make sense for you. Uh, more so southern addresses would have an earlier start. More northern addresses would have a later start, uh, even to the extremes of Vermont and Canada. Uh, can Canadian beekeeper Ian Stepler, his bees are in storage until March. Uh, and he has, you know, he's not getting into them until they're brought out of storage. Uh, and this is part of the challenge for learning beekeeping is you can have great resources like Mr. Stepler, 
But because he is in such a different part of the world than you are, a lot of his recommendations don't line up with your own needs. Uh, case in point here, the flows and swarming conditions and when they show up. Uh, Mr. Stepler in, in, in Canada, in Manitoba, uh, Miami, Manitoba, they can split their colonies a solid month before the honey flow. Here, our locust flow hits roughly at the same time we start to get decent flight weather for queens. Uh, around Derby Day, around the first weekend of May. And we'll have drones earlier, and people will try to split colonies earlier, but the reality is queens need fairly warm temperatures for mating flights, and they usually can't find those until we get into May. So we really can't split colonies until we're already in the honey flow, which makes management much more difficult. Now, a question that will commonly come up is how early can I split my colonies? Uh, the reality is every nuke buyer wants their bees as early as they can have them. Uh, and the reality is we, we're stuck working on the bee schedule. Uh, like I said, often it's not warm enough to get queens made until May 1st around here. And that is a hard thing to hold out until May 1st to start rearing queens. But that's the reality. You can do it earlier. You're usually going to have pretty high losses and a lot of unmated queens, and just a lot of difficulty trying to get those colonies split earlier than that. Uh, the reality is the longer you hold those bees in that hive, the better off you are until they swarm. Uh, and equally, if you're splitting hives or pulling bees out of hives to reduce their swarming urge or to make more colonies, uh, splitting might not be the best way to proceed. Uh, splitting implies you take the colony and split it right in half, well, half of them are going to have no queen for a little bit until they reset themselves. Uh, if you just pull a nuke out and take less of the resources, you can keep the main hive mostly intact and mostly in production while still getting you a second hive and another queen on the way. The takeaway I want you to have from this is we're ultimately dealing with nature. Uh, we're ultimately dealing with the cadence of the seasons and what the bees are doing in response to that. As much as we'd like to manage by calendar, the reality is we need to see what the bees are up to and adapt our expectations and our goals relative to what the bees are capable of doing at that time. Uh, a lot of us kind of fall into the engineer's trap that we can will the bees to do whatever we want them to do. That's really not how bees work. You can only give them so much direction and they only take so much advice. Uh, so just keep your expectations um, constrained. <laughs> and with that, I'll say good luck and happy beaking.